Tenerife is the largest island of Spain's volcanic Canary Island chain, located in the Atlantic Ocean off the northwestern coast of Africa. For decades, the islands have served as a popular port of call for cruise ships and their passengers from all around the world. This was the reason both Pan Am Flight 1736 from Los Angeles and KLM Flight 4805 from Amsterdam were headed to Grand Canary Island. Both jumbo jets were chartered flights filled with retirees as well as families with children destined for voyages around the Canary Island chain. On March 27, 1977, both Pan Am 1736 and KLM 4805 were scheduled to land at Grand Canaria Airport on Grand Canary Island. But while en route, both aircraft, along with dozens of others, were rerouted to the small single runway Los Rodeos Airport, located about 70 miles west of Gran Canaria Airport. Both flights had been routine, until they approached the islands, when air traffic controllers contacted them, telling them that a bomb had been detonated by local terrorists in the Gran Canaria Airport passenger terminal. There had been a phone call before warning them of the bombing, giving them time to evacuate the airport. But soon there was another call warning of a second bomb. So at that point they had no choice but to close the airport and reroute traffic to the closest airport, which was 70 miles away on the island of Tenerife. The problem was, however, that Los Rodeos Airport was mostly a general aviation airport not intended for large commercial aircraft. And in a sad ironic twist, the Pan Am crew informed ATC that they had plenty of fuel and they preferred to circle Gran Canaria in a holding pattern until the airport reopened, but still they were ordered to land on Tenerife. While it's true that this tragic event was a confluence of everything that could go wrong did go wrong, there is one ignition source however that everybody seems to agree on, myself included. And that is that the captain of the ill-fated KLM 747 was at the heart of the catastrophe. No captain in modern history since Captain William Bly has been more vilified than KLM Captain Jacob Van Zanten. As far as anyone who has investigated the crash, there is no debate that the responsibility of the devastation rests squarely on the shoulders of Van Zanten. 
but should it? While it's true that Van Zanten's actions were woefully negligent, a series of natural and man-made phenomena also played a heavy hand in the outcome of the world's worst aviation disaster. Hollywood couldn't have scripted a more perfect image of an airline captain than that of KLN Captain Jacob Veldhuizen Van Zanten. Odds are that many passengers on board KLM Flight 4805 while thumbing through the glossy pages of KLM's in-flight magazine came across the centerfold picture of a silver-haired 50-year-old dashing 747 captain having no idea that that man wasn't a paid model but in fact. Captain Jacob Van Zanten, who was in the cockpit on their very flight that day. Captain Van Zanten was KLM's chief of flight training for the 747 and one of their most senior pilots. Coincidentally, about two months before the accident, he had conducted the Boeing 747 qualification check ride on his co-pilot of Flight 4805, Klaus Muirs. Captain Van Zanten was somewhat of a KLM celebrity as his photographs were used for publicity materials such as KLM magazines and billboard advertisements. As a matter of fact, immediately following the Tenerife crash, KLM executives had initially suggested that Van Zanten should lead the investigation, unaware he was the captain involved and had been killed in the accident. But while Van Zanten had a pearly white smile and movie star looks, he also had a salty disposition and demanded loyalty over teamwork, traits which soon would come to haunt everybody on the sleepy vacation island before that day would end. Tenerife's Los Rodeos Airport is located in a valley at the base of the Earth's third largest volcano, Mount Titi. Mount Titi's presence will add to today's chain of catastrophic events. While the volcano is a popular tourist destination, it can also affect the weather on the small island, and more specifically, the weather at Los Rodeos Airport. Low-lying clouds that often surround the volcano's 12,200-foot peak often creep down to the airport on the valley floor below, blanketing it with a thick, dense fog. And unfortunately, today would be one of those days that the fog would swoop in like a silent, murky freight train. More than 50 aircraft of all shapes and sizes jammed the small airport's ramps and taxiways as they all jockeyed for places to park. When the dust settled, the Pan Am, KLM, and two other aircraft ended up parked at the mouth of the runway, with KLM in a third position in front of the fourth place Pan Am jet. As local plane spotters on Tenerife all flocked to the airport for this once-in-a-lifetime plane spotting opportunity, one resident snapped his photo, the only picture taken that day before the crash showing the Pan Am jet lined up on the taxiway stuck behind the KLM jet. And this position that Pan Am now finds themselves in will add one more link to today's disastrous chain of events. Finally, after more than a three-hour delay, the aircraft's radios crackled back to life at about 3.45 p.m. when they heard the tower say, Gentlemen, please be advised that Las Palmas is now open. Now, as the assembled aircraft began to button up and get ready for their taxi clearances, none was more excited than the Pan Am crew. Because unlike the other planes that allowed passengers to deplane, Pan Am decided to keep their passengers on board, so now they don't have to round everybody up at the last minute. But soon the Pan Am crew's excitement turned to frustration, because just as they thought they were getting ready to taxi, they were shocked to see that KLM's Captain Van Zanten made the unusual and unnecessary decision to call out a fuel truck to top off the Jumbo's fuel tanks. There was already plenty of fuel on the KLM plane, but Van Zanten was in such a hurry to get back to Amsterdam after he dropped off his passengers at Las Palmas that he didn't want to have to refuel just 20 minutes later on Gran Canary. Also, as we will come to find out, the extra weight the additional fuel added to his aircraft may have been the difference between life and death. But this selfish move on Van Zanten's part didn't go unquestioned by the Pan Am crew. 
Pen Am's Captain Grubbs got on the radio and rang up Van Zanten and asked him exactly how long is this pit stop going to take. And Van Zanten answered him with a sarcastic sigh of frustration in his voice and said, 35 minutes. But still at that time, the weather was clear and sunny. But like I said, it can change in an instant. In the 35 minutes it took for KLM to refuel, a thick wave of dense fog began to roll down the walls of Mount Titi and blanket the valley floor in Los Rodeos Airport below, reducing visibility to about 300 meters, setting up the perfect storm of events that was about to come. Finally, at 4.58 p.m., after receiving an additional unnecessary 14,500 gallons of fuel, KLM First Officer Klaus Mears contacted the Tenerife Tower for permission to begin their taxi for takeoff. Since Los Rodeos had just a single runway and the taxiways were full of planes, departing aircraft were being instructed to backtrack the runway, which means taxiing down the runway and exit the runway on a taxiway and backtrack, or as was in the case of the KLM, they made a 180 degree turn at the end of the runway in order to take off in the opposite direction. Then at 5.02 p.m., Pan Am was told to begin their taxi down the runway behind KLM. But unlike the KLM, Pan Am was instructed to turn off the runway to backtrack on the taxiway, so the runway would be clear for the KLM to take off. But this is the point where things started to unravel really fast. Due to many factors, ranging from misunderstanding the accents of the air traffic controllers as well as their confusing instructions, to the fact that now the fog was so thick the visibility was less than 200 meters. The Pan Am crew was unsure exactly which off-ramp to take. The tower told the Pan Am to exit the third exit, but due to the reverse angle, this turn was impossible to make in a 747. Additionally, this would have brought them right back to the terminal. So the fourth exit was the logical turn to make, especially because the other planes had already been doing just that. So Pan Am carefully headed for that ramp. To make matters worse, now the fog shroud had thickened to near zero visibility. Even worse than that, Los Rodeos Airport didn't have ground radar, so the controllers in the tower had no idea where any of the aircraft on the ground were in the fog. By now, the visibility was so poor that the Pan Am captain had slowed down to barely three knots, just in an attempt to see the lines on the runway. Meanwhile, the tower was relying solely on communication from the pilots to tell them where they were on the airfield. As KLM completed its taxi, the tower told them to turn a 180 and line up and wait. But for some reason, the KLM captain and chief flight instructor Von Zanten started to push the throttles forward and began to take off. Just then, the KLM first officer blurts out, wait a minute, we don't have ATC clearance yet. Van Zanten then snapped back, I know that, I know, go ahead and ask. This meant that Van Zanten was going to take off without clearance. More shocking to Van Zanten was that he was not used to his subordinates questioning his judgment. But this only seemed to add to Van Zanten's frustration and saltiness. Then the KLM co-pilot reported to ATC that they were ready for takeoff and were given departure instructions. But still, they were not yet cleared for takeoff. That's totally different from departure instructions. So the KLM pilot repeated the instructions. But then he added a strange comment that shocked the Pan Am crew when they heard it when he said, We are now at takeoff. But the Pan Am crew said, What does he mean by that? Since the KLM wasn't cleared for takeoff, the Pan Am crew rightly assumed they would hold until given the takeoff order, because they were still on the runway taxiing to make their turnoff. So the Pan Am first officer got on the radio to tell the tower, hey, wait a minute, we're still taxiing. 
and the tower correctly replied, please report when clear. But in the KLM cockpit almost immediately, as later investigation of the timeline would reveal, the brakes were released, Van Zanten opened the throttles, and KLM 4805 began its takeoff roll. Unaware that the Pan Am was yet to clear the runway, Tenerife Tower then replied to the KLM who should have still been holding. KLM, stand by for takeoff, I'll call you. But this critical call simultaneously coincided with the transmission from Pan Am, telling the tower, no, uh, we're still taxiing down the runway. But in another fateful link in the chain of disasters on this day, the two transmissions jammed each other and only a shrill noise lasting 3.74 seconds was heard by the KLM crew. The Tenerife Tower then asked the Pan Am crew to report when they clear the runway. When Pan Am replied, OK, we'll report when we're clear, suddenly this alerted the KLM flight engineer who asked Captain Van Zanten, wait, is he not clear then? After he repeated the question, the captain barked back, he's clear, he's clear. But Van Zanten couldn't possibly know. Meanwhile, in the Pan Am jet, the crew saw the rotating beacon of the KLM jet as its lights began to rapidly approach them. Then the Pan Am crew saw the KLM's nose lift off and they knew they were in trouble. It was then that the KLM crew saw that the Pan Am plane was still on the runway. Captain Van Zanten desperately tried to get airborne, but the speed was too slow and the rotation was too early. Also, the added weight of the last minute fuel Van Zanten took on came into play here as well. The KLM's tail scraped the runway for 20 meters. Simultaneously, the horrified Pan Am crew turned the aircraft to the left and applied full power in a desperate attempt to get out of their way. The KLM managed to get airborne, but just as it passed over the Pan Am, the undercarriage tore through the fuselage just behind the cockpit, embedding the KLM's landing gear in the Pan Am jet. The KLM jet came crashing down just meters down the runway. It exploded into a fireball. The Pan Am jet also burst into flames. Both planes were completely destroyed. All 324 passengers and 14 crew aboard the KLM plane perished, while 326 passengers and 9 crew of the Pan Am flight were killed. Only 56 passengers and 5 crew of the Pan Am flight survived. The combined death toll was a staggering 583. Amazingly, all 3 cockpit crew members of the Pan Am flight survived uninjured. Some of the final report findings found that in the final minute before the collision, key misunderstandings occurred among all parties involved. Most importantly, the KLM captain was apparently convinced that he had been cleared for takeoff, while the Tenerife Tower was equally certain that the aircraft was awaiting takeoff clearance. A couple of vital transmissions also got jammed. Had they not been, they would have been understood by the KLM crew allowing them to abort the takeoff. They also found that the Pan Am aircraft was still on the runway because it had missed unmarked Link 3 due to very poor visibility and direction from the tower. In fact, the control tower and the two aircraft were never in visual contact at all. They also found out the KLM captain was in a hurry because he was concerned his crew might violate Dutch regulations on maximum duty hours. To avoid refueling at the next stop, he took on additional fuel at Tenerife, which resulted in a longer takeoff roll, besides adding many tons of fuel to the blaze. Captain Van Zanten was the most senior KLM pilot, and it would not have been easy for his junior crew to point out even an obvious mistake. The controller on duty was probably overwhelmed by the sudden and unexpected increase in traffic, and may not have been able to remain abreast of the rapidly changing situation. From the ATC log, it appears that the Pan Am captain was more alarmed by the fateful KLM takeoff call than the tower was. But in the end, the final report laid the blame entirely on the shoulders of KLM Captain Van Zanten. So, what do you think? Is it wrong for me to place the majority of the blame on Captain Van Zanten? There sure was enough blame to go around. Most of all, including Mother Nature. Let me know down below.
You know, videos like this take months of research and weeks of production. And if you'd like to see more videos like this on the channel and you'd like to help me produce these videos, you can always click on the merch shop and the buy me a coffee app. Links are always in the description. But you never need to spend a dime to subscribe. So on your way out, please make sure you do that. And don't forget to like, share, and ring the bell. And remember, leave the rubber on the runway and your troubles on the ground. And I will see you next time in the air. Yeah, this is Maximus.